In this video, we're going to talk about adrenal crisis. And in order to talk about adrenal crisis, we're going to break down some of the normal functions of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, as well as the adrenal cortex and the medulla. And some of the functions that the hormones that we'll see being released will play. So first, we need to start off with the hypothalamus and the role the hypothalamus plays with the anterior pituitary gland in releasing ACTH or adrenal corticotropic hormone. So what we have here is our hypothalamus and we have what's called the hypophysal portal system, where you can see here we have little nerves that can release neurotransmitters into the blood supply which then can circulate down into the anterior pituitary gland, releasing additional hormones. So when we are looking at adrenal crisis, typically we're talking about alterations in uh, the adrenal hormones of CRH, ACTH, and then the mineral corticoids and the glucocorticoids uh, that are going to be released as a result. So what happens when we have a reduction in mineral corticoids or glucocord corticoids, or we have something that's stimulating the release of uh, mineral corticoids or glucocorticoids, is the hypothalamus will respond. So we initially see a response by the hypothalamus, in which the hypothalamus is going to use these nerves to release CRH. So the hypothalamus is responsible for releasing CRH, also known as corticotropin-releasing hormone. So this is our corticotropin-releasing hormone. So that is manufactured by the hypothalamus and is released by the hypothalamus through a neuroendocrine system. So that uh, CRH would be released by these nerves into the blood supply, and then they would travel down this blood supply to impact the anterior pituitary gland. So that's what we're looking at down here, is this portion here is the anterior pituitary gland. Over here we have the posterior pituitary. And what CRH does when it enters the anterior pituitary gland is it's going to stimulate the release of ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. So as the CRH makes its way down uh, to the anterior pituitary gland, it's going to stimulate the anterior pituitary gland to then release ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone. So ACTH is released. ACTH will then travel to the adrenal cortex, will bind to the adrenal cortex, and this is where we can see the release of mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. And for the sake of Addison's disease, we're going to talk about uh, two different mineral or min different mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid. So when we have binding of ACTH to the adrenal cortex, this is going to support release of aldosterone, uh, which is a mineral corticoid. So primarily here, we're gonna be talking about aldosterone. And we also see the release of a glucocorticoid. And the primary glucocorticoid that we're going to talk about is cortisol. So primarily, we're gonna talk about cortisol here. So we should talk about some of the primary functions of our mineral corticoids and our glucocorticoids, and we'll start with aldosterone. So if we think about aldosterone, we know aldosterone plays a large role in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone syndrome uh, system, and we can walk through that here. So we know that aldosterone is kind of a later step. So in the system, we see renin, which will be released by a reduction of blood pressure that's sensed by the juxtaglomerular cells. So if the juxtaglomerular cells recognize blood pressure falls, then we start to see a release in renin, and that triggers the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The release of renin is going to lead to uh, the transformation of angiotensinogen into angiotensin-1. So we see uh, this is going to create angiotensin uh, one, or we'll call it AG1 or AGT1. 
Angiotensin 1 circulates to the lungs where we see uh, angiotensin converting enzyme that is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, so AGT2. Um, and as we mentioned, that's occurring in the lungs by our angiotensin converting enzyme. Uh, so that's going to travel down to our lungs. Let's draw our lungs in here. AC and ACE is going to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is what is going to trigger the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. So it stimulates the adrenal glands to release uh, aldosterone. And aldosterone has a couple of different functions. One of the functions of aldosterone is to reabsorb sodium from the proximal convoluted tubule. So we can see the reabsorption of sodium from the PCT. Um, and what that's going to do is also help with the reabsorption of water. So as sodium is reabsorbed, water will follow. So we have reabsorption of sodium followed by uh, reabsorption of water. If you think about the fact that our renin was released in response to low blood pressure in an attempt to increase the blood pressure, then it makes sense that aldosterone would uh, support the reabsorption of sodium so that water can follow and attempt to bring up blood volume and increase uh, our blood pressure. The other thing that we see aldosterone doing is it's promoting the excretion of potassium in the distal convoluted tubule. So aldosterone does this through a number of mechanisms. So aldosterone will increase the function of the sodium potassium pump. Aldosterone will increase the efflux of potassium from cells into the renal tubules. So we see an increase in excretion. Aldosterone essentially supports the pushing of potassium out of the blood supply into uh, the renal tubules. So we see excretion of potassium into the renal tubules. So potassium or aldosterone has two important roles here. One is it responds to increased potassium. So when we have release of aldosterone, it's going to lead to uh, increased potassium excretion in the distal convoluted tubule. So we're going to get rid of more potassium in our urine. And then the other function of aldosterone is that we're going to see uh, increased reabsorption of sodium. So we start to see increased reabsorption of sodium. That means that we're taking more sodium back into the blood supply. And as a result, water follows, and that should uh, lead to an increase in blood pressure. So with that reabsorption of sodium, we should also see uh, an increased reabsorption of water. And as a result, uh, the patient's uh, blood pressure should go up. So that is what we're seeing in uh, with regards to aldosterone. So aldosterone plays a number of kind of key functions in our fluid and electrolyte balance, which can be a challenge when we don't have enough of it. And that's what we're going to talk about with uh, someone who's experiencing uh, Addison's disease. The other piece that we're going to talk about is what happens when someone, uh, or what is the function of cortisol? So if we take a look down here at the medulla, again, we're talking about the, uh, the adrenal cortex, or if we take a look down here at the adrenal gland, we're talking about the adrenal cortex. We can talk about the function of cortisol, and cortisol has a number of different functions. Cortisol acts as a counter-regulatory hormone or it plays a role in increasing blood glucose levels. So one of the kind of core functions of cortisol is it acts as a counter-regulatory hormone. And what that means is uh, it is going to respond when blood glucose levels are low or it basically assists in increasing blood glucose levels. And it does that through a number of different mechanisms. One of the mechanisms that we see is that we can have protein breakdown or fat breakdown. Uh, so we draw in uh, some kind of protein and uh, fat. So if we're looking at, say, our, our muscle tissues or our fat tissues, what we end up getting uh, when we release cortisol is an increase in proteolysis or the breakdown of proteins, as well as an increase in 
in lipolysis. So we get a breakdown of proteins and lipids. And the function of that, or why we're breaking down those proteins and lipids, is it will allow for an increase in glucose uh, production. So uh, when you break down proteins and lipids, you can basically increase gluconeogenesis, or the formation of new glucose. So we can see an increase in blood glucose levels. The other piece that makes cortisol counter-regulatory hormone is that it is going to cause an increased resistance to insulin. So one of the kind of key fe features that makes cortisol as a counter-regulatory hormone is the proteolysis and lipolysis that increases uh, gluconeogenesis or the formation of glucose. The other piece is that it's actually going to uh, increase insulin resistance, which will lead to um, less storage of our glucose. So we'll have a higher uh, blood glucose level. So we see increased resistance uh, to insulin. So cortisol plays a large role in as a counter-regulatory hormone and how it uh, helps assist in management of blood glucose. The other thing that cortisol will do when it's released is it reduces inflammation. So when cortisol is released, we actually start to see a decreased activation of the immune system or decreased activity within the immune system, which means that we're going to have uh, less immune response and less immune cells to respond. So we have uh, decreased activity within the immune system, which for patients uh, with increased cortisol actually leads to a decrease in the immune response. Cortisol plays uh, a couple of other roles uh, for patients. So one of the other things that we can see in patients who uh, have higher levels of cortisol uh, is that they'll have thinning of their skin and their vasculature. So uh, cortisol will lead to thinning of the skin and vasculature. And finally, uh, we also will see an increase in parathyroid hormone and osteoclast activity. So the other thing that an uh, increase in cortisol will cause is an uh, increased release of parathyroid hormone, which is typically released when our calcium levels are uh, lower. So we'll see an increase in parathyroid hormones. We kind of draw a bone in here. We get an increase in parathyroid hormone, which increases osteoclast activity, which is going to break down bones and increase the amount of calcium that's being released. So we start to see an increase uh, in parathyroid hormone, which is going to promote bone breakdown. So we're gonna see the promotion of kind of bone destruction which is going to lead to the release of calcium. Uh, so we actually see an increase in calcium release because an increase in parathyroid hormone is actually going to increase osteoclast activity. So as you can see, aldosterone or cortisol are playing important roles in homeostasis. So it's really important that we have a properly functioning system where we have CRH being released um, that is going to allow for ACTH to be released, and then we can have the stimulation of mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. So when we talk about adrenal crisis, what we're talking about is what happens when someone has too little um, of these hormones or of these adrenal corticoids and mineral corticoids, and what are the consequences of that? So in order to end up with Addison's disease, there are a couple of different things that could lead to this occurring. And really, we can have Addison's disease or we can have a adrenal insufficiency. And we'll talk about kind of two different ways uh, that we can get this. One, and the traditional uh, mechanism through which someone gets Addison's disease is they have an immune response. So what happens is the body actually creates antibodies that are going to target the ACTH receptors with on, within the adrenal cortex. So we'll draw in uh, some antibodies here. And again, these antibodies are essentially self antibodies or antibodies that are looking to destroy the ACTH receptors. So what can happen is if someone has an autoimmune problem, uh, they can have antibodies that target the ACTH receptors. And if you think about the consequence of this is that these antibodies will 
bind to and destroy the ACTH receptors with on, uh, on the adrenal cortex, and they'll no longer be functional. If ACTH can't bind uh, to the uh, ACTH receptors, then the adrenal cortex doesn't know that it's time to release uh, our adrenal corticoids and mineral corticoids. The other thing that can happen is when someone is taking a large amount of an exogenous uh, steroid. So if we picture someone who's on high levels of prednisone, for example, what happens is we start to get a negative feedback loop. So I'm just going to draw the blood supply in here. And say we're taking uh, PO or by mouth, a large amount of prednisone. Uh, so we have this exogenous steroid that's entering the system. So say we have our steroid here. So we'll say that this is, uh, just for the sake of this example, this is prednisone. And the prednisone is entering the blood supply and begins circulating. Now, again, we're taking this medication to perform the function of some of these steroids that we produce endogenously, like our aldosterone or our cortisol. So we take the exogenous uh, steroid and it can circulate through the blood supply. Well, what happens when it circulates, um, we're going to see a response by the hypothalamus. So this hy hypothalamus will recognize, or the hypothalamus can recognize, that we have an increase in steroid level. So the hypothalamus can recognize this increase in steroid level and it can stop um, basically releasing CRH, or we get negative feedback. So if the hypothalamus senses the increase, we can get a negative feedback loop, or this can create a negative feedback. And what that means is the body will stop producing CRH because it feels as though enough uh, steroid has been produced. So. Typically, as aldosterone and cortisol levels go up, the hypothalamus is going to stop releasing CRH in order to um, not go overboard or maintain that homeostatic effect. So what we end up getting is this negative feedback by taking exogenous steroids because it senses that there's a high degree of steroid and it stops releasing the CRH, which will then stop releasing ACTH and the patient can end up not uh, secreting the ACTH needed to stimulate the adrenal gland. This is one of the uh, reasons why patients are often uh, weaned off of steroids. So if we're looking at steroid use, what can happen is the patient can take exogenous steroids, which will increase blood concentration. So we start to see increased blood concentration of these steroids which can be sensed by the hypothalamus. So this increased uh, blood concentration is recognized by the hypothalamus. And as a result, we get negative feedback. Basically the hypothalamus thinks that it has performed its function. So we get a negative feedback loop occurring, which means that we start to see a decreased release of CRH which then would decrease the release of ACTH. And we would start to see reduced release of our hormones from the, our steroids from the adrenal cortex. So decreased release from the adrenal cortex. And that can be an issue when a patient abruptly stops steroid therapy. So if they stop that steroid therapy immediately, the body hasn't had time to slowly recognize this piece fading, slowly increase its own production of CRH, its own production of ACTH, and then start stimulating the adrenal cortex to release uh, the steroids that it's responsible for. The other consequence is a little bit easier to understand. The other risk factor is when someone has Antibodies that target the ACTH receptors, they have an autoimmune disease, those antibodies will target the receptors, kill them off, and then we won't uh, be able to see their function. So those are two mechanisms in which we can see someone leading to adrenal insufficiency. So what we should talk about next is, well, how does this happen or what is the uh, issue associated with this? And we'll kind of start from the top in terms of what does adrenal insufficiency look like? 
So we know that we have a couple of primary causes. One can be an autoimmune disease. And the other can be uh, basically rapid cessation of exogenous steroids. In either case, we know the consequence to that is that we're not going to have activation of ACTH receptors, whether that is because antibodies have killed those receptors, or in this case, we have no ACTH to release. What starts to happen is we have decreased activation of ACTH receptors. which means that the patient is going to release less aldosterone as well as less cortisol. So let's start with aldosterone and the impact of a decrease in aldosterone release. So we know that one of the consequences we can expect is a decrease in aldosterone release. And this is one of the primary categories that's gonna to lead to pathology in these patients, or this lack of aldosterone is going to be uh, a big challenge for patients who have adrenal insufficiency. So decreased production or release of aldosterone. So a couple things happen as we see that. One of the consequences of this is we are going to see a decreased excretion of potassium. So we know that as we have a reduction in aldosterone release, one of the things that's going to happen is the body is not going to be able to increase the pumping of uh, potassium into the distal convoluted tubule. So we'll see decreased excretion of potassium into the distal convoluted tubule. And as a result, the patient will become hyperkalemic or start to see increasing potassium levels. There's a couple issues associated with increasing potassium levels. So if we remember about what's happening in low levels, we start to increase our threshold potential. So if we look at low levels of hyperkalemia, what starts to happen is your resting membrane potential becomes closer to threshold and it's easier to activate. So this puts the patient at risk of VTAC or VF or tachydysrhythmia. Once we get into high levels of hyperkalemia, the problem that exists here is that resting membrane potential overcomes our threshold. So resting membrane potential, it becomes so positive that it becomes more positive than threshold. And these are the cases where we actually start to see uh, deactivation of sodium channels and the patient becomes bradycardic. So you get those classic kind of sine wave uh, symptoms of hyperkalemia. So deactivation of sodium channels in the patient here is at risk of bradycardia. So not inconsequential uh, consequential when we're looking at someone who's at risk of hyperkalemia. And we'll put our life threats in, uh, in red here. So hyperkalemia is one of the primary life threats for adrenal insufficiency. One of the other problems that we're going to see is we see re a reduction in retention uh, of sodium from the renal tubules. So we're going to see a decreased retention of sodium from the renal tubules. We start to see decreased reabsorption. of sodium. So that means that we're taking less sodium from the renal tubules and putting it back into the blood supply. And there's a couple of consequences of that. One is the patient will end up with hyponatremia. So they won't have enough sodium to provide um, the functions that sodium kind of has for our body. So we have decreased reabsorption of sodium, which is going to lead to hyponatremia. So this can lead to alteration to the membrane potential. So if we don't have enough potassium, that means that our action potential phase um, or when we meet threshold, sodium will be able to enter the cells more slowly because we don't have as much of it. And that will uh, lead to a decrease in action potential, which can lead to CNS depression. So we had hyponatremia, which uh, can lead to an alteration of our membrane potential, or essentially we see slower movement of sodium. because there's not as much of it. 
during action potential. which can lead to uh, CNS depression. So patients can lead to CNS depression. And we can see a loss of vegetative function, which is a challenge. The other problem is that if we're not reabsorbing sodium into our uh, blood supply, that means we are not reabsorbing water or the patient has a decreased reabsorption of water. So less reabsorption of sodium means decreased reabsorption of water and the patient is at risk of dehydration so we get decreased reabsorption of water into the kidneys um, which means the patient is going to urinate more so not only we're we not reabsorbing as much um, water we start to see an increase in urination as the patient is trying to get rid of the water that's within the renal tubules and the patient will lose their fluid volume we start to see a decrease in fluid volume. And one of the risks for these patients is uh, basically hypovolemia and hypotension. Now we can look at the flip side of this uh, and talk about, well, what is the problem with um, someone who is experiencing the loss of cortisol as well, because we talked about the function of cortisol and how cortisol is going to play a role here. So what happens is we will have decreased uh, release of cortisol. So we have the decreased production and release of cortisol as a result. So we start to see decreased levels of cortisol. So the patient is at risk of seeing decreased cortisol levels. And again, cortisol is going to play a couple of important uh, roles. So one is if we have a decrease in cortisol levels, that means we're going to become, we're going to have an increased sensitivity to insulin. So remember, uh, cortisol plays a role uh, as a counter-regulatory hormone. So typically, it would reduce insulin sensitivity and increase gluconeogenesis, the, promo uh, the formation of new glucose. If I have a decrease in cortisol levels, will we actually see is an increase in insulin sensitivity. So the body becomes more uh, sensitive to insulin. And if it becomes more sensitive to insulin, we're going to see more glucose storage. So we actually start to see uh, increased GLUT4 transporters, which is going to mean that we're going to increase glucose storage. So we're gonna see a lot more glucose entering into the cell, and we're also gonna see an increase in glyconeogenesis, or the formation uh, of new uh, glycogen. So the patient is at risk of, of basically uh, hypoglycemia because we are storing a lot of glucose. The other kind of consequence of this is that we're gonna see a reduction in proteolysis and lipolysis that are gonna allow for gluconeogenesis. So we see a decrease in proteolysis, we get a decrease in lipolysis, which means that we can't make as much new glucose. So we see a reduction in what we call gluconeogenesis, or the formation of new glucose. And as a result, the patient becomes at risk of hypoglycemia. So in these patients, we typically will see uh, low blood glucose levels. So we get hypoglycemia. And this can be one of the things that's confusing for these patients is we get the hypoglycemic patient and um, our immediate response is we want to correct that with dextrose or glucagon. Um, but what's more appropriate in these patients is actually correction with something like hydrocortisone, which is going to fix all of these problems rather than simply uh, fixing the hypoglycemia problem. So in terms of adrenal insufficiency, a number of kind of life threats or issues associated with this. The patient's at risk of hyperkalemia, which can lead to dysrhythmia. Patient's at risk of hyponatremia, which can lead to osmotic gradient disruptions, which can lead to fluid shifting out of the brain and CNS depression, as well as an impairment of our action potential. This can lead to less fluid absorption, so the patient will urinate more and retain less fluid, which puts them at risk of hypovolemia and hypotension. And then they're not gonna have as much gluconeogenesis, 
or um, the sensitivity to insulin is going up and we're at risk of hypoglycemia. So a number of consequences of adrenal insufficiency for these patients. The last thing that we often see uh, in these patients is hyperpigmentation of the skin. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, when we have a, a loss or a decrease in ACTH, what we often see is an increase in melanin. So the patient has an increase in melanin. And this increase in melanin actually pigments the skin. So we can get kind of like a golden colored skin or the patient uh, will present with hyper uh, pigmentation. So we can see hyperpigmentation as a result of an increase in melanin, which is another kind of characteristic uh, feature in someone who has Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency.